Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Robert Farrell here today. Uh, Dr. Farrell uh, received his master's and PhD in electrical and computer engineering from UCSB, where he is currently a postdoctoral student in uh, materials department. Uh, he is responsible for supervising the research of a large group of students working on three nitride light emitting diodes, solar cell, and lasers. And for those who don't know, uh, Dr. Farrell's graduate advisor actually got the Nobel Prize this year in physics. So uh, Dr. Farrell's doctoral work also helped trigger the formation of the startup company Sora, which is situated in Silicon Valley. And he has received many awards, including 2012 article highlights award from the Semiconductor Science and Technology, and 2013 Spotlights article award from Applied Physics Express. So let's welcome Dr. Farrell. All right, well, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, uh, Professor Majumdar. Um, before I begin, uh, I'd like to thank the department for inviting me here today, and also thank everyone in the audience for uh, taking the time to come to my, uh, my presentation. So today I'll be talking about three nitride materials for uh, sustainable uh, energy applications. I'll begin with an overview of my future research plans. And from there, I'll move to my research background, including my doctoral work on three nitride M-plane LEDs and laser diodes. I'll explain later what I mean by uh, M-plane. And then from there, I'll move on to my postdoctoral work on three nitride C-plane solar cells. And again, I'll explain what C-plane is uh, a little later in the talk. And unfortunately, I won't have much time to talk about my current work that Professor Majumdar just referred to, uh, which involves directing the research of about 15 graduate students working on uh, LEDs, lasers, and solar cells. Um, but I do have some slides at the end of my talk on that work in case anyone has any questions about it. Um, and then finally, I'll move on to my future research directions, which include uh, nanostructured solar cells, power electronic devices, and nanowire LEDs. And finally, I'll wrap up with uh, summary and, uh, and conclusions. So there are a number of challenges uh, facing sustainable energy, including improving energy generation, uh, improving the efficiency of energy conversion, and developing energy efficient applications. Uh, so as shown here on the left is a uh, table of power per unit land area or water area for a number of different renewable energy technologies. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is that solar cells have a power per unit land area that's about an order of magnitude higher than any other technology. Now, if we think about that from a national perspective, we could actually power the entire country with a 600 kilometer by 600 kilometer square of solar cells represented here in yellow. That's about 12.2% of the area of the continental US. Now, I'm not suggesting that we actually do that. Um, however, my point is, is that if we are going to dedicate solar cells to a large portion of our energy generation, we should use the most efficient solar cells possible, which I'll be talking about later. Um, in the center of this figure is a pie chart that shows all the major uh, forms of electricity generation and that 10% of all of these, of all this electricity generation is lost to conversion inefficiencies. This is mainly due to the fact that silicon uh, power electronics have a conversion uh, efficiency of about 90%, whereas gallium nitride based electronics have a conversion efficiency of about 97 or 98%. Uh, finally, moving on to energy efficient applications, lighting takes up about 18% of our electricity consumption However, according to the US DOE, if we can switch over mainly to solid state lighting, this number should fall well below uh, 10%. So for my future research, I'd like to develop a number of solutions related to sustainable energy. Um, these include uh, um, work on three nitride solar cells with nanostructured anti-reflection coatings for energy generation three nitride power electronics with emerging materials like indium aluminum nitride for efficient energy conversion, and three nitride nanowire LEDs with green emission from uh, the semipolar sidewalls 
for uh, energy efficient applications. And again, I'll explain in a minute what semipolar means. So I had an interesting PhD experience. I had four members on my dissertation committee. Two were specialists in crystal growth who had joined appointments in the materials and electrical engineering departments. Uh, one was a microscopist in the materials department, and one was a device physicist in the electrical engineering department. And these four professors had an uncommon degree of collaboration. Uh, they shared funding, they shared lab space, they shared equipment, and they even shared graduate students. So from this experience, I learned about the benefits of collaboration, but I also learned about the uh, benefits of having an interdisciplinary approach to research and the importance of understanding materials related issues to make high performance devices. And this is a theme that I'll keep coming back to in this talk, and I'll show a couple of examples from my former research. Now, before I move on to that, I would like to show an image of a TEM of gallium nitride on sapphire. Uh, down here on the bottom is a sapphire substrate, um, which is a typical substrate used for gallium nitride. And on the top is the uh, gallium nitride. Each of these black lines is a dislocation. So the typical dislocation for gallium nitride is about 5 times 10 to the 8 inverse centimeter squared. That's about 1,000 times the dislocation density of gallium arsenide substrates and about a million times the dislocation density of silicon substrates. In addition, gallium nitride has a very high density of point defects and also a high density of stacking defaults. Now, even though uh, the material quality uh, is so low and there are so many defects, researchers have been able to demonstrate LEDs with wall plug efficiencies in excess of 80% high electron mobility transistors with breakdown voltages um, greater than one kilovolt, and solar cells with internal quantum efficiencies greater than 90%. And the way they've been able to do this is by controlling the, mater the materials uh, to make the devices perform like they would like. So next I'll move on to my uh, research background. So starting with my doctoral work and some motivation for uh, M-plane LEDs and laser diodes. So there are a number of applications for visible LEDs. Uh, the big one is solid state lighting, um, but they're also used for decorative lighting, automobile lighting, displays, agriculture, and even color tunable lighting. So for color tunable lighting, you can change the color from warm white to cool white or anything in between, or even off-white colors. Uh, there are also a number of applications for visible laser diodes, including red laser diodes for DVD, blue laser, laser, laser diodes for Blu-ray discs, and RGB laser diodes for um, uh, projection displays, both for stationary displays and for mobile displays. The eventual goal is for everyone to have a projection display in their cell phone that they can bring to uh, meetings to project, uh, project, project images on the wall. So there are two main materials that are used for visible uh, light emitting devices. Uh, on the left here is um, energy versus lattice constant. Uh, the first material is indium gallium nitride, which is lattice matched to gallium nitride. And that material is used to make blue and green uh, LEDs and laser diodes. The other material is aluminum gallium indium phosphide, which is lattice matched to gallium arsenide. And that is used to make red uh, LEDs and laser diodes. So shown on the left here is a unit cell of gallium nitride. The plane represented, shown here in blue, is a C plane. That's the plane on which most uh, industrial growth is done. The problem with the C plane is that there's a polarization along the C axis shown here. And the reason um, there's a polarization can be understood by looking at this ball and stick model. The nitrogen atoms have a much higher electronegativity than the, uh, than the gallium atoms, which are represented in black. So the electrons are essentially drawn towards the nitrogen atoms. Now, since the wurtzite crystal structure lacks inversion symmetry, um, what we end up getting is a polarization along the c-axis. Now, if we try to grow crystals along the green a-plane or the red m-plane, 
these planes are actually charge neutral, which you can see here on the left, and they have no polarization. Um, so expanding on this a little, here's the C plane again, and the two nonpolar planes. There's also an infinite number of semipolar planes shown here in green. And these planes have less polarization than the C plane, but of course more polarization than the uh, nonpolar planes. And uh, I'll talk about them more later in this talk. For now, I'll be focusing on the M plane for my doctoral research. So one of the questions is, what is the effect of polarization on band diagrams? So shown on the left is a C plane, uh, indium gallium nitride, gallium nitride quantum well. And on the right is an M plane, indium gallium nitride, gallium nitride quantum well. The indium gallium nitride has a smaller band gap than the gallium nitride, so you end up forming a quantum well. So for the C plane case, the polarization actually tilts the energy band diagrams, which separates the electron hole and wave functions and uh, reduces their overlap, which reduces the recombination rate and the efficiency of the devices. However, for M-plane devices, there is no polarization, so there's a high overlap between the electron and hole wave functions and a high recombination rate. There's additional benefits for laser diodes, um, which you can see here for the band structure. Uh, on the left is strained C-plane indium gallium nitride, gallium nitride bulk layers, and on the right is strained uh, M-plane bulk layers. I'm showing bulk layers, not quantum moles here, because they're easier to visualize, but the result is pretty much the same. So for the strained uh, C-plane layers, what we can see is that they have very high uh, densities of states, even with lateral biaxial strain. However, for the strained uh, M-plane layers, the unbalanced biaxial strain leads to significant reduction in the density of states. And these lower density of states result in lower transparency carrier densities and higher differential gains for M-plane laser diodes, which lead, should lead to higher efficiency uh, lasers. So next, I'll describe a fabrication process for uh, self-aligned ridge waveguide laser diodes um, but as it, before that, uh, or after I show that, I'll describe a materials problem that made it difficult to actually fabricate these lasers, and then finally describe how we overcame that problem to make high-performance lasers. So um, shown here is a very simplified epitaxial structure with n-type layers, an active region, and p-type layers. We start out with a ridge lithography that has uh, two lithography steps one with an undercut uh, on the lower resist from the top resist. Then we etch down, uh, dry etch, to right above the quantum walls and deposit an insulator. And you can see there's a gap between the, uh, between the bottom insulator and the top insulator. Then we can lift off the top insulator um, simply with sonication and a solvent. And this is why this is called a self-aligned ridge wave fed laser diode, deposit a P contact, and deposit a uh, probe pad, and then we're done. So the critical step in the process is this, this layer uh, in the upper left here, it, the P-type uh, gallium nitride layer, is typically about one micron thick. And we need to control the etch depth to within 50 to 100 nanometers. Now, if the etch is too shallow, there's insufficient lateral mode confinement. Uh, in other words, there's not enough of a step in uh, index confinement to confine the mode in the lateral direction, which is the, the left to right direction here. Also, there can be significant carrier losses due to current spreading underneath the ridge before the carriers make it to the active region. In contrast, if the etch is uh, through the active region, um, we can have current leakage through the, uh, the insulator uh, shown here. And we can also have a drastic decrease in uh, device lifetime because of surface recombination on the uh, walls of the ridge. So you can see from all these issues, we need precise control of etch depth uh, to make high performance laser diodes.
So next I'll describe the p-type gallium nitride thickness fluctuations that I mentioned a few slides ago that made it difficult to make high performance laser diodes. So um, one bit of nomenclature before I move on. Um, shown here again is the unit cell of gallium nitride. And the M-plane shown here in red is typically referred to as the on-axis M-plane. However, we can tilt a substrate a small angle away from the on-axis surface. Um, so I'll be discussing later in this talk uh, um, devices that have uh, miscut or misorientation, and I'll be using those words uh, interchangeably. So on the left is an image of what the typical surface looks like for uh, a, a um, layer grown on an on-axis M-plane substrate. It has a very um, high density of these uh, pyramidal um, uh, features. Um, we denoted the different uh, size of the features as the C plus face, the C minus face, and the uh, two A faces that are, um, that are equal by symmetry. So these hillock dimensions were quite large. They're about 100 to 300 microns. You could actually see them by eye. So you can imagine they'd be a problem for device fabrication. So we grew a device, uh, um, an LED sample, to uh, try to understand this. Um, they are grown on on-axis M-plane gallium nitride substrates. We used thick P-type gallium layers to mimic the thickness fluctuations seen in a laser diode structure. Um, these are about a micron thick. Typically in LED, they're about uh, 300 nanometers thick. And we actually etched trenches in the P-type gallium nitride to measure the thickness. So due to different band bending at the surface, you can actually see the difference between the uh, P-type layers and the, and the N-type layers. So shown here are two different SEM images from the, uh, from the same sample. Um, so what you can see is that the shallowest measured PN junction is about 0.9 microns, and the deepest measured junction is about 1.25 microns. This is on the same sample with a measured variation in junction depth of about 350 nanometers. So you can imagine when we're trying to do a one micron etch to within 5,200 nanometers of the active region, how a fluctuation of 350 nanometers would affect our ability to make high performance laser diodes. So the next thing we wanted to know is what is the origin of these pyramidal helix? We know they're a problem, but where do they come from? So one clue to their origin is just looking at optimal, optical micrographs of the samples uh, before and after LED growth. So you can see that the surfaces are covered with pyramidal hillux both before and after uh, LED growth. Um, however, after the LED growth, the C plus facets are steeper, the C minus facets are shallower, and the same thing with A facets. So this tells us since the shape of these, uh, these samples are changing during the growth of the LEDs, that may be where the thickness fluctuations are coming from. So next, we took some cathodoluminescence measurements of these samples. And these samples have an eight micron undoped gallium nitride layer, which is grown by MOCVD. These dark spots here are generally correlated with threading dislocations. And the density of the dark spots is about 5.9 times 10 to the 6 inverse centimeter squared, which is the same as the substrate, so we know we're not generating any new threading dislocations. And what we see is a single dark spot at the apex of each pyramidal hillock. So that tells us that these hillocks are somehow related to the, uh, to the dislocations, but it doesn't really tell us anything else beyond that. So to understand this a little better, uh, we did some AFM on these samples. In the upper left is a uh, amplitude image. You can see the atomic steps on all the different faces of the pyramidal hillock. And the lower right is a um, zoomed in uh, height image of one of these pyramidal hillocks. And what, what we see is a pin step at the apex of the hillock. So what this confirms is that the apex of the hillock is terminated with a screw component dislocation. Anytime a screw component 
dislocation intersects the surface of a free crystal, it forms a pin step. So we know this is a screw component dislocation, not an edge component dislocation. So this indicates that the hillocks are formed by spiral, spiral growth, as you can see from the image, around screw component threading dislocations. So the next question is, how does this actually occur? So shown here are the two different uh, competing growth modes, spiral growth and step flow growth. So for spiral growth, we have a screw component threading dislocation and a pin step. Um, and there's a certain frequency uh, associated with how this spiral grows around this pin step. And then the other uh, competing growth mode is step flow growth. And there's a certain frequency for steps passing through the top of a spiral or pretty much any given point in space. And that's generally related to the spacing between the steps. Now, if the angular frequency for spiral formation is greater than the angular frequency for uh, step flow growth, we get, step, we get spiral growth on our samples. If the reverse is true, we have step flow growth. So the way the spirals actually form is uh, denoted here as u for the top of the step and d for the bottom of the step. They start by growing first uh, down, or at least they grow towards the bottom of the step. In this case, I have it shown as down. Then they grow down and out. Then they grow down and out and up, and then down and out and up to the left. And this continues and as the spiral continues to grow. Meantime, uh, spiral step flow growth uh, is also proceeding on the surface, and these two growth modes are competing. So now that we know where the pyramidal hillocks come from, the next question is how do we eliminate them? So on the left is the step terrace geometry for an M-plane surface. Um, and uh, shown here is the spacing uh, for each step uh, and also the angle of the miscut. So this equation relates the angle of the miscut to the step spacing. And as the angle of the miscut goes up, the step spacing goes down, and the frequency of steps passing through a given point in space goes up. So that makes physical step sense. If these steps are very close together, you would imagine that more of them are passing through a given point in space uh, in time. So eventually, as we keep miscutting the sample more and more, eventually the frequency for uh, step flow growth exceeds the frequency for spiral formation, and we get step flow growth. So once we get step flow growth, uh, the next question is, what happens to the pin steps? Well, the pin steps start to form, and they start to um, grow out in all directions. But before they can complete one full rotation, the free steps pass through the pin steps. And they create a, um, what you end up getting is a pin step and a kink around the pin step. And if you look at the surface of a gallium nitride sample with a high uh, density of dislocations, you actually see many features like this. So to actually uh, um, eliminate these pyramidal hillocks in practice, what we did is we took a number of uh, gallium nitride samples that were doped with silicon with different miscuts that are denoted here in the lower left-hand corner, so from zero degrees out to about three degrees. And these samples are miscut towards the uh, C minus direction. We looked at all kinds of directions. Uh, that was the uh, best direction for these samples. And what we can see is that there's a continuous reduction in, uh, in hillocks for small misorientation angles, and the complete elimination of hillocks for misorientation angles greater than uh, 0.8 degrees. And even for larger angles, we start to get these undulations. So we did AFM on these samples and took uh, 10 by 10 micron uh, AFM scans. Um, and plotted here as uh, RMS roughness versus misorientation angle. Um, for the samples with hillocks, the data was taken from the uh, C minus facets. And for those samples, we can see the RMS roughness is very low. But of course, uh, this is not what we're looking for because they have pyramidal hillocks on them. For the larger samples, greater than about, or the samples with larger misorientation angles, greater than about 1.5 degrees. Um, we have lateral undulations, so the RMS roughness gets very uh, large. However, right around one degree, um, the samples have an optimal combination 
of uh, hillock elimination and smooth uh, microscopic morphology. We also grew some LEDs on top of these samples. On the left is uh, LIV curves for these LEDs. And on the right is output power and voltage versus misorientation angle measured at 20 milliamps. That's a typical uh, drive current for a 300 by 300 micron LEDs. And uh, these LEDs were measured by uh, on wafer probing um, and measuring the light through the bottom of the devices. So what we can see is that the voltage is constant and the output power uh, drops off with misorientation angle. However, for angles less than about one degree, it's relatively constant. So based on this data and the data on the previous slide um, and also this data showing the morphology and the output power, we decided to use one degree as our standard misorientation angle for, future, for our future work. And then finally, to verify that we're actually um, uh, eliminating these uh, fluctuations in junction depth, we looked at two samples, an on-axis sample and a sample with a two degree mist cut. And you can see the etch depth for both samples is constant, which we would expect. For the on-axis sample, there's a significant fluctuation in etch depth. And for the, um, for the sample with a two degree mist cut, um, we can see that there's uh, almost no uh, variation in junction depth which was our goal from the beginning. So going back to um, this image once again, now that we can control the thickness of the p-type gallium nitride, we can control the etch depth and make high performance lasers. So next I'll discuss uh, some work on low threshold current density uh, M-plane through nitride lasers that were enabled, again, by this uh, ability to control the etch depth on our lasers and control the uh, thickness of the p-type gallium nitride. So on the left is the laser structure. It has eight nanometer uh, quantum wells, which are much thicker than C-plane quantum wells um, because there's no polarization fields. So we can make the, the quantum wells uh, thicker and not have to worry about reductions in wave function overlap. And also, there's 50 nanometer uh, indium gallium nitride uh, wave guiding layers on either side of the quantum wall. On the right is a simulation of the, um, of the mode profile versus position in the structure. We can see it's well-defined by this structure. Um, and also the um, confinement factor is relatively high, around 9%. So shown here is the uh, output power versus current density for a laser diode before and after uh, coating uh, um, the facets with optical coatings. The details of the optical coatings are shown here on the right. What I'd like to draw your attention to is that the threshold current density of this laser diode is about 1.54 kiloamps per centimeter squared uh, after coating. Now, that's much higher than an indium phosphide or a gallium arsenide laser diode, but if we compare it to other C-plane laser diodes, what we can see is that previously reported uh, nonpolar and semipolar laser diodes had threshold current densities that were two to three times higher than C-plane laser diodes, um, whereas this particular uh, C-plane laser diode had a threshold current density that was uh, just about as low as uh, C-plane laser diodes. And these C-plane laser diodes, by the way, were the best uh, industry reported laser diodes. So using university uh, level technology, we were able to make lasers uh, um, that were that performed as well as industry lasers. So moving on, uh, some groups in industry actually at uh, Sumitomo Electric looked at green laser diodes at 530 nanometers, which is uh, a much more difficult wavelength to make laser diodes. And they compared the threshold current density versus the wave wavelength between these semipolar laser diodes and C-plane laser diodes, and what they saw was that the semipolar laser diodes had uh, much lower threshold current densities than the C-plane laser diodes, which is what you would expect for lasers with lower transparency carrier densities and lower differential efficient, uh, lower, um, higher differential gains, excuse me. So once we were able to make high performance laser diodes, we could actually determine the internal parameters for M-plane uh, three nitride laser diodes. So um, the plot on the left shows inverse differential efficiency versus cavity length. 
uh, typical practice is to take a fit to the devices with the highest differential efficiency. The intercept of this data gives the injection efficiency for the lasers, and the slope gives the uh, internal loss. So from this uh, data, we can see the injection efficiency is 66%, um, and the internal loss is about 9.8 inverse centimeters. So these low values of internal loss and injection efficiency are consistent with the low p-type gallium nitride doping levels of about 1E19. Now we dope these lasers low to intentionally get low losses, which we achieve. However, we think the low injection efficiencies are also related to the low doping. So from the data on the last slide, we could actually plot material gain versus current density. Um, shown here as a three-parameter fit for that data. And we can see the data is nearly linear. This indicates uh, that the um, density of states in these very wide quantum models is possibly bulk-like. But the most important point is that we have a very low value of the transparency uh, um, current density for a relatively wide active region. So as I mentioned earlier, since the density of states for strained uh, M-plane uh, indium gallium nitride gallium nitride layers is lower than C-plane uh, layers, we should have um, lower transparency carrier densities. So what we did is try to calculate the transparency carrier densities based on our data. So if we know the transparency current density, and we know the thickness of the active region, 24 nanometers, and we know our recombination coefficients, A, B, and C, we can actually calculate the transparency carrier density. So shown in this table, our A, B, and C coefficients from six different references. And in all cases, we find transparency carrier densities that are in the mid 10 to the 18s. Now this is very significant because these transparency carrier densities are about an order of magnitude lower than reports for C-plane laser diodes. So this agrees very well with the um, band structure shown here. So next, I'll move on to my postdoctoral work on uh, three nitride C-plane solar cells. And I'll start with some motivation. So on the right is a plot of the solar spectrum versus photon energy and the band gaps for the uh, three materials that are typically used in multi-junction solar cells, germanium, gallium arsenide, and indium gallium phosphide. And what you can see is that the indium gallium phosphide is not very good at converting these very high energy photons. However, indium gallium nitride with about 30% indium or less uh, can efficiently convert these, uh, can convert these high energy photons. And the reason I say 30% indium gallium nitride is because that's about the maximum amount of indium that we can grow lattice matched gallium nitride. It's about a 3% strain. So our goal here is to integrate three nitride single junction cells with three arsenide multi-junction cells to improve the utilization of high energy photons for multi-junction solar cells. So multi-junction solar cells are typically used in concentrated photovoltaics. So as shown here is a CPV system. And what it consists of is an array of uh, Fresnel lenses. And at the, um, each of these Fresnel lenses is focused on a very small uh, solar cell. And this array uh, actually tracks the sun through the sky so that the light is always shining right on the solar cells. So CPV is actually ideal for utility scale uh, installations. It has the lowest land impact of all PV technologies. Um, other technologies like thin film technologies or sil silicon technologies, you actually have to raise the land and just put down solar cells and there can be nothing else there. In the case of CPV, there's no permanent shadowing, and there's potential for dual land use, such as grazing or agriculture, or also native species can also survive in the um, same area that these, uh, that these solar cells arrays are, are located at. So the main system costs um, for, these, uh, for these systems are in the concentrating optics and in the solar trackers. And the concentration is about 1,000x. So the devices are very small. So the device growth and fabrication is a very small fraction of the total system cost. 
So we can make very complex solar cells, much more complex than silicon cell, solar cells or thin, thin film solar cells and still make uh, and not affect the total so cost of the system very much. So shown here is a gallium nitride device bonded to a gallium arsenide device. I'll describe all the details of this device more later. On the right is a plot of junction band gaps versus a number of junctions. The five band gaps, the, the five junction band gaps shown here for the um, uh, five junction cell are the same as the band gaps here in the cell. And there's also a plot of cell efficiency versus number of junctions. And the predicted cell efficiency for the um, number of junctions increases by four to five percent by adding a gallium nitride cell on top of it. So the goal here is to achieve a multi-junction solar cell with a conversion efficiency of greater than 50%. Right now, the record stands at about 46%. To do that, though, we have to understand how the nanoscale structure affects the device performance. So indium gallium nitride is grown at relatively low temperatures to prevent the desorption of indium. However, when we grow at low temperatures, V defects uh, nucleate, um, which are composed of six 101 bar one planes. And that's shown here on the right. The structure is here on the bottom, and a cross sectional TM is shown on the top. Um, and a cross section, they look like Vs. That's why they're called V defects. And they tend to increase in size with increasing layer thickness due to low, um, uh, they should say gallium, not gallium nitride, uh, diffusion rates on the surface. So basically, the C plane grows faster than the semipolar planes and essentially grows itself out of existence. However, if we grow at higher temperatures, that increases the gallium diffusion rates and the V defects are uh, quickly planarized and we get a smooth surface. So for our solar cells, what we do is we use indium gallium nitride, gallium nitride, multiple quantum wells, instead of thick indium gallium nitride layers to control the morphology by growing, gallium, by growing the gallium nitride barriers at higher growth temperatures to planarize the V defects. So on the left is a typical uh, solar cell, except it has a very small number of uh, quantum wells in it, um, just because it's used for diagnostic purposes. On the right is a um, uh, detailed image showing how the quantum wells are grown. The uh, indium gallium nitride quantum wells are grown in nitrogen carrier gas because if you grow uh, indium gallium nitride in hydrogen, the hydrogen actually etches the indium. On top of that, we grow a, a gallium nitride cap in uh, nitrogen carrier gas. Um, this is grown at the same temperature as the quantum wells, and it's also grown in nitrogen carrier gas to protect the quantum wells. And then on top of that, we grow a barrier at a higher temperature than the quantum wells to planarize the V defects and also in hydrogen carrier gas, because that also tends to have a planarizing effect. So the total thickness of gallium nitride cap plus barrier is held constant at six nanometers. Now on the right is a plot of photoluminescence intensity uh, versus wavelength for different cap thicknesses, this layer. And what we can see is that as we go to thinner caps, the peak decreases and goes to shorter wavelengths. Now for devices, uh, shown here is EQE versus wavelength and current density versus voltage. Um, we can see that increasing the gallium nitride cap layer thickness changes the shape of the EQE and increases both the EQE and the short circuit current density at zero volts. So the question is, why is this occurring? If we look at TEM of these two cases, the two extreme cases, 1.5 nanometer caps and 3 nanometer caps, we can see that the 1.5 nanometer caps uh, have quantum walls with severe thickness fluctuations, and the 3 nanometer uh, gallium nitride cap layers result in quantum walls with uh, very uniform thickness. So what we think is going on is that the V defects in the thinner cap layers oops, may not uh, completely fill in during the cap layer growth or they may erode during uh, ramp up to the barrier growth temperature in hydrogen. So in summary, this nanoscale structure essentially reveals why the EQE and short circuit current density increase with increasing cap layer thickness. 
So once we knew how to control the microstructure of the quantum walls, we could move on to creating high quantum efficiency solar cells with a large number of quantum walls. So this is the structure of our solar cells. Um, it's similar to the solar cells shown before, 2.5 nanometer quantum walls, 8 nanometer barriers. On top of that is 250 nanometers of uh, um, intentionally roughened PGAN. So what we did in this structure is we intentionally suppressed the V defects in the quantum walls, but we actually intentionally roughened the P-type gallium nitride by growing it at low temperature to create V defects to increase the optical path length through the active region. So these are AQEs of our best devices and also some devices from other universities shown in red, orange, and yellow. Um, for our 30X devices, we can see that we have uh, very good um, structural integrity. And these devices also had relatively high fill factors and uh, open circuit voltages. However, when we went to 75X quantum walls, what we can see is somewhere around 50 quantum walls, quantum walls start disappearing. It's kind of hard to see in this image. And up towards the top, they even start crossing over one another. Um, and these particular devices had a reduction in fill factor and uh, open circuit voltage. So even though there was a reduction in electrical properties, what I would like to point out is that these devices had an EQE of greater than 80%, which means the IQE is greater than 80%. And these devices actually have uh, quantum walls that are 1 eV deep. So of all the photons that we're absorbing, 80% of them are escaping from this structure, even though there are just dozens of quantum walls that is, are 1 eV deep, which is quite remarkable. And we don't totally understand uh, why this is occurring. We think it may be related to tunneling. So again, moving back to uh, this image, the goal here is to achieve a multi-junction solar cell with a conversion efficiency of greater than uh, 50%. Um, and next I'll move on to uh, my future research directions. So um, as I mentioned, there's a number of challenges related to sustainable energy. Um, including improving energy uh, generation, improving the efficiency of energy conversion, and uh, developing um, uh, new uh, energy efficient applications. Um, so in my future research, I'd like to work on a number of solutions related to sustainable energy, um, including uh, three nitride solar cells for energy generation, three nitride electronics for efficient energy conversion, and three nitride nanowire LEDs for energy efficient applications. Um, and as I mentioned before, to make high performance devices, we need to understand the materials issues underlying those devices. And this is uh, a strategy that I plan to use in my future research as well. So I'll start with nanostructured solar cells. Um, again, back to this figure. Um, the goal is to achieve a conversion efficiency of greater than 50% by bonding two solar cells together. Um, the most important aspect we'll need to work on is the active region in the uh, indium gallium nitride uh, solar cell. So we've grown active regions with 30 quantum moles uh, shown here. We need to grow active regions with 75 or more quantum moles with high structural integrity for higher absorption. There's also another, uh, uh, a number of other things that need to be addressed to make this uh, device successful. We need topside broadband anti-reflection coatings. So these need to be broadband because there's a wide range of band gaps um, uh, for, for this device. Also, we need interfacial uh, broadband AR coatings because the index of gallium nitride does not match the index of gallium arsenide. Um, also, we need to find a material uh, that's a, that can make a low loss, low dispersion bonding inner layer. I suggest BCB. In addition, the uh, grid contacts for spreading the current need to be aligned for low shading loss. And finally, uh, we need to find collaborators for four junction uh, gallium arsenide based cells. Um, I have a couple of contacts at NREL and Spectrolab 
that have actually uh, seen this, um, this project and are interested in participating in it. So we've actually been doing some very exciting research recently on hybrid anti-reflection coatings. So the idea is shown in the left here. We have a substrate with a given index, and then we have a thin film optical coating with alternating layers of silicon dioxide of a low index and layers of a higher index, and then anti-reflection nanostructures etched into a thick layer of silicon dioxide. So the idea is shown in the lower left here, um, which shows the uh, refractive index versus height. So we start out with the index of air. We gradually grade it up to the index of silicon dioxide, so there's no, there's no reflection there. And then we use a traditional AR coating to match the silicon dioxide to the substrate. Now this should give us a much better uh, AR coating than matching the substrate to air because the difference between the SiO2 and the substrate is much less. So on the right is a plot of reflectance versus wavelength. And you can see for a standard multi-layer air coating, the average reflectance over the entire solar spectrum is about 2.4%. However, for the hybrid uh, AR coating, the average reflectance is about, um, is about 0.6% over the entire range. So what we can see is that the hybrid AR coating outperforms the multi-layer AR coating and demonstrates almost uh, near-perfect broadband reflection. We also measured uh, reflection versus angle. So on the left is uh, um, the data for the hybrid AR coating. On the right is the data for the measured AR coating for both uh, simulated and measured. Um, this is actually on sapphire, uh, but it's, it's very similar to gallium nitride. So what we can see is that the hybrid AR coating on sapphire outperforms multi-layer AR coatings with less than 1% at all measured uh, wavelengths and angles less than 45 degrees. So not only are these coatings useful for solar cells with direct incidence, like multi-junction solar cells, they're also useful for silicon solar cells, thin film solar cells, organic solar cells, and a whole other uh, range of applications where you wanna decrease uh, uh, reflection. So moving on to uh, power electronic devices. On the left is a plot of on resistance versus breakdown voltage. And I'd like to draw your attention to the silicon, the silicon carbide, and the gallium nitride curves. So what we can see is that gallium nitride and silicon carbide have much higher breakdown voltages and lower on resistances than silicon. So however, they're very similar to one another, silicon carbide and gallium nitride that is. So one of the questions is what is the advantage of gallium nitride over silicon carbide? Well, the advantage is that the gallium nitride can be grown on inexpensive sil silicon substrates, unlike silicon carbide, which needs to be grown on expensive silicon carbide substrates. In addition, uh, we can grow heterostructures with gallium nitride. So this is what a typical high electron mobility transistor looks like for uh, gallium nitride. There's an aluminum gallium nitride that's typically 20 to 30 percent uh, aluminum, and it's about 20 to 30 nanometers thick on top of a gallium nitride layer. Now, since there's a difference in polarization between these two layers, there's a fixed surface charge, which is positive, and that induces a two-dimensional electron gas. This two-dimensional electron gas has a very high mobility of about 2,000 uh, centimeters squared per volt second. Silicon carbide, on the other hand, has a mobility of about 100 to 800 centimeters squared per volt second, depending on uh, what part of the device you're looking at. It's about 100 in the channel, and that pretty much limits the uh, speed of the device. So gallium nitride devices are almost about 20 times as fast for switching frequency. So there's a number of applications for three nitride electronic devices. Uh, in the past, they've been developed for uh, RF applications, mostly related to uh, communications. Um, they're also currently being developed for medium power applications. Uh, like solar inverters and also inverters for electric vehicles. And in the future, the goal is to use them for high power applications that are currently dominated by silicon carbide, such as uh, um, grid scale uh, energy uh, power modules and also wind turbines. 
However, there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done before we can move to the uh, high power applications here. Uh, similar to silicon, uh, we're not quite sure at this time what's the best gate insulator for gallium nitride. Shown here are the diff are different band offsets for different gate insulators. The larger the band offset is, um, and the better the insulator is at uh, uh, preventing leakage between the uh, gate into the gallium nitride. Um, all these different materials also have different dielectric constants and also different interface state densities. So there's a trade-off between many of these different materials. In addition, the interface state densities can depend on pretreatment conditions, deposition conditions, process compatibility, et cetera. So there's quite a bit of work that still needs to be done on gate insulators for gallium nitride. Also, I mentioned earlier, aluminum gallium nitride is used on top of gallium nitride in traditional high electron mobility transistors. However, indium aluminum nitride with 18% indium is lattice matched to gallium nitride and can be used to create two-dimensional electron gases with very high sheet densities. So the reason for this, if I go back a couple slides, is the um, Fermi level is pinned at the surface and the band, uh, the conduction band starts to slope downward. If you can make this thicker, it slopes even further down into the Fermi level and you can get even higher uh, sheet carrier densities. So aluminum gallium nitride it, as I'm, is strained, so you can only grow at a certain thickness before it cracks. However, aluminum indium, nit indium aluminum nitride is not strained, so we can grow it very thick. However, there's problems with growing it um, due to fluctuations in alloy uh, composition. So this is a TEM and this is an atom probe uh, tomography map of these samples. The white areas and the red areas are high indium content er areas. And the problem is that indium nitride likes to grow at low temperature and aluminum nitride essentially likes to grow at high temperature. So it's hard to combine them. Um, so there's been a lot of work on growing these alloys under optimal con conditions, although it can be done. So mo finally, moving on to nanowire LEDs. On the left is a plot of luminous efficacy versus time uh, generated by the Department of Energy. So what luminous efficacy is, is that's lumens per watt. So lumens is essentially the amount of power that your eye sees. Watts is the amount of power that goes into the device. You want the luminous efficacy to be as high as possible. So the dotted lines are phosphor converted uh, LEDs. Uh, so that's essentially where you have, let's say a blue LED that um, uh, illuminates a phosphor that converts the light. And the uh, solid lines are color mixed RGB LED packages. So what we can see is that the future efficacies of RGB LEDs are predicted to be 50 lumens per watt higher than phosphor converted LEDs. In addition, RGB LEDs can be used to generate any color. So you could have smart solid state lighting that could be cool white, warm light, like I mentioned before, or any color you want. Whereas phosphor converted LEDs are pretty much stuck at one color. Um, however, the problem is blue and red LEDs are relatively efficient, whereas green LEDs are typically 30% or less EQE. So to achieve the full potential of solid state lighting, what we need are efficient green LEDs. So one way I think we can actually achieve this is with nanowire LEDs. On the left is an array of nanowire LEDs. On the right is a cross section of a nanowire. Uh, typically you start with some sort of dielectric mask, grow an n-type nanowire through the mask, and then dislocations tend to come up through the opening and for reasons that researchers don't completely understand, they bend at the bottom of the nanowire. And the nanowires are usually dislocation free. So you can grow M-plane quantum wells on a very inexpensive sapphire substrate that are nearly defect free and then P-type gallium nitride on top of that. These are referred to as core shell nanowires. Now the downside of M-plane gallium nitride is that it incorporates the least amount of indium of any plane that we know of. So shown here are a number of semipolar planes that incorporate more indium to move us from blue to green. These are grown on top of bulk gallium nitride. These are 20 nanometer indium gallium nitride layers. And at UCSB, we've actually made very efficient uh, green LEDs on top of bulk semipolar uh, uh, gallium nitride substrates. 
So you may ask, why don't we just make efficient LEDs on top of these bulk gallium nitride substrates? Well, the problem is they're prohibitively expensive. So what I'm interested in doing is growing LEDs on the uh, semipolar sidewalls of gallium nitride nanowires and actually growing very short nanowires that consist mostly of semipolar sidewalls on very inexpensive sapphire substrates. So finally, moving on to uh, summary conclusions. Um, for my uh, research background, I showed that if I eliminated uh, pyramidal helix on my laser diode samples, I was able to make high performance laser diodes with uh, very low transparency carrier density. By suppressing V defects on my uh, solar cells, I was able to achieve multi-quantum mole solar cells with 75 quantum moles and IQEs greater than 80%. And finally, by uh, making AR coatings with nanostructures on them, I was able to achieve near-perfect anti-reflection over the entire solar spectrum. Moving forward, I'd like to improve the growth of solar cells and develop bonding technologies to make bonded multi-junction solar cells with greater than 50% efficiency. And I'd like to work on gate insulators and emerging materials like indium aluminum nitride to create three nitride power electronics with uh, greater than 98% efficiency and high breakdown voltages. And finally, I'd like to grow green LEDs on the semipolar sidewalls of nanowires to make high efficiency green LEDs uh, uh, for solid state lighting applications. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Yeah. Thank you for uh, combining material science and uh, device technology. It's very nicely demonstrated. I have one comment. Uh, you are using surface nanostructures to increase the uh, collection efficiency, if I understand correctly. Um, the last oh, the, the, the solar cells, yes. Solar cells. Yes, right. This is just off the, off the wall type of uh, comment. Have you ever looked at the plant uh, surfaces of uh, leaves of variety of plants. They live actually under a variety of conditions. Mm. They, they have surface structures that actually dictate their, uh, the way, you know, it's a, a, a genetic uh, uh, selection that uh, they, they actually survive in these kinds of uh, low light lighting conditions. So by by the collecting the most sunlight. Most sunlight and variety of uh, wavelengths. So um, the, the question was, or the first comment was that we, we used uh, V-defects nanostructures on our solar cells to increase the light collection. Um, and the question was, have we considered looking at leaves or other, um, um, other living structures to actually also increase uh, light collection? And um, no, we haven't, but that, that, is, a, that is a very uh, interesting idea. Um, the, the thought was that the, the leaves are able to collect quite a bit of sunlight under very low light conditions. Other questions? Oh, sure. There are plenty of questions, but uh, this is, can you actually replace indium? Because uh, it, it seems like uh, uh, you're, you're trying to get your best devices at higher, higher uh, temperatures, and yet indium is really moving around to uh, cause defects as well as compositional changes. Um, so th the question is, can we replace indium um, because it's, it's a problem for growth, it's moving around. Um, the, the three main materials we have to work with, um, at the very beginning I showed a band diagram of uh, indium, aluminum, gallium, nitride. Uh, th those are kind of the, the, four, um, the, the four materials we have to work with. So. Um, I wish we could, 
because uh, in, in indium nitride is, the, the big problem is indium nitride likes to evaporate, uh, whereas uh, gallium nitride is grown at an even high temperature and uh, about 200 degrees higher than that, uh, ideally for the binary growth. And then aluminum is another couple hundred degrees. Aluminum nitride is another couple hundred degrees higher than that. So um, unfortunately, I, there, there's not another element that I know of that we could use to, um, to replace uh, indium. But it, it would be nice if we could. Could you comment on the life expectancy of these devices? How long do you think they can continue operating efficiently? For how many years? Um, if you build those solar cells, for example. Um, so usually the goal is, is 10,000 hours or more. A lot of them are rated 30,000, 40,000. So it depends. It, it, it's, I'm sorry, the question was how, how long can these um, devices operate for. Um, so I talked about solar cells and electronics and, and LEDs. Solar cells would be running half the day, LEDs less than half the day. So it partly it depends on how, how long that is. Um, 10,000 hours. I bought some LED bulbs and I tried to calculate how long that would be. It, it's, it's several years. It's like a, it's like a decade for decade or two decades for typical use. And they, they, don't, they, don't, um, they don't burn out like a traditional light bulb that just sort of fade away. Um, solar cells would probably actually last much longer because they're at much low, lower current densities. I have another crazy idea. <laughs> okay, this might be totally silly. But how about putting a boron into the system to keep in. Um, so, and you have also inject holes. To, to inject holes? Yeah. I mean, you, you replace nitrogen with boron. So you have, you have one less electron. <coughs> at the same time, keep indium in the structure. So the, the question was can we replace boron instead of nitrogen in the, uh, in, in the structure? Um, so, um, researchers have looked at that, but th there's issues with solubility. So, no, no one has, has really achieved it yet. But that is, that is um, something that, that has been looked at. Um, so, okay. Oh. Okay. So, if not, just thank you, Robert, again.